Now I want to talk about safer and more effective ways to address the symptoms of anxiety and depression by looking at root causes of neuroinflammation. I believe that to truly address root causes of psychiatric illness, biological, emotional, mental, and spiritual causes needed to be addressed. But today, I am focusing more narrowly on biological neuroinflammation with the root causes of mold, infections, and mast cells. In addition, I'll look at trauma as another root cause of depression and anxiety, and briefly address how understanding dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system is more useful clinically than simply labeling a symptom cluster of behaviors as depression or anxiety. I've spoken about the role of chronic inflammation in causing neuropsychiatric symptoms for more than 10 years. And by now, in 2023, the role of neuroinflammation in psychiatric illness is well established in science. Unfortunately, it's still news to most people, both physicians and patients probably because the drug companies have not yet found a simple neuroinflammation pill that works better than diet, exercise, and fish oil. Numerous environmental and biological factors contribute to non-resolving chronic inflammation, including obesity, diet, early life stress, psychosocial stress, permeable gut epithelium, and T-cell dysfunction, including pro-inflammatory TH17 cells and anti-inflammatory Tregs. SIRS and EMFs are newer, but equally as potent. And remember, obesity is a major side effect of SSRIs, so now we have the treatment for depression possibly contributing to its prolongation. As many in this audience know, SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome is a very common root cause. SIRS is often mistaken for a neuropsychiatric syndrome such as depression or anxiety. And although SIRS consists of many symptoms spread out through multiple organ systems, as soon as the physician detects a psych symptom, the physical symptoms are often ignored. It is so common for a prescriber to see tears or hear the word depression or anxiety and reach for their prescription pad, cutting off any further discussion of all the other symptoms. I see this reported every day in my clinical practice. Now, the multitude of symptoms seen in SIRS is overwhelming and does challenge diagnostic algorithms. We see problems in energy production and in the respiratory, muscular, neurological, GI, and a lot more. Most patients, when I see them for the first time, have at least one or more neuropsychiatric symptoms present, such as generalized anxiety, most common initial symptom, insomnia with daytime fatigue, second most common symptom, mood swings, frequent tearfulness, depression, reduced ability to cope with stress and panic attacks, lack of motivation, irritability, anger with poor impulse control, aka mold rage, and at times passive suicidal ideation. Cognitive impairment, memory lapses, word finding difficulties, difficulty in assimilating new knowledge seem so commonly that they are usually just referred to as moldy brain. However, and this is important, most patients do not have enough symptoms to fulfill diagnostic criteria for a full DSM syndrome, despite being told they do. Now, oh, this is what it means when a doctor tells a patient there's nothing wrong with you that psychiatry can't cure, and realize this quote is from a real note written in the chart of a physician patient. In other words, you are told you have a mental illness, and all the physical symptoms listed above, such as tachycardia, shortness of breath, chest pain, fatigue, appetite changes, constipation, lack of focus, have been explained away as somatic manifestations of a primary mood or anxiety disorder. And this is another key point for my talk. When a patient's symptoms lie slightly out of the knowledge base of the prescribing provider, the most common solution offered is an antidepressant. Although denial of the reality of a patient's symptoms has been going on forever, remember MS was once thought to be hysteria, 
It seems to have reached a critical tipping point during COVID. More succinctly, this is now known as gaslighting. It's the new meme for nothing here psychiatry can't cure. And this is an important slide to understand how to differentiate inflammation-induced sickness behavior from the psychiatric syndrome called major depression. Sickness behavior is a well-studied inflammatory phenomenon in animals caused by high cytokines. Another word for it is the cell danger response. It involves malaise, fatigue, psychomotor retardation, and social withdrawal. Think of how your cat or dog behaves when it's sick. It hides in a closet and play with its favorite toys, refuses to eat or even drink water. And most people understand that this is a sign to take the animal to a vet. However, in people, we tend to label the same behaviors, reclusiveness, fatigue, loss of appetite, anhedonia, lack of pleasure, and usual things as depression. So now we begin to see how the DSM-5 checklist of symptoms could be lumping different syndromes with different causes all in one heap called depression. This is a list of some infectious and neurotoxic pathogens that have also been associated with psychiatric illness. Besides biotoxins, we have neuroline, Bartonella, streptococcus leading to pans, viral encephalopathies, which includes now COVID and toxoplasmosis associated with suicide and schizophrenia. Inflammatory cytokines such as MMP9 and TGF-beta are used in diagnosing mold illness. Both have a role in increasing blood-brain barrier permeability and activating glial excitotoxicity. The others, interleukin-6, are very well explored in psychiatric illness. Neural inflammation, again, is a well-studied cause of psychiatric illness, and the next three slides present meta-analysis levels of evidence to give you an overview of the strength of this research. We commonly find elevated inflammatory cytokines in mood and anxiety disorders. And here are four meta-analyses of depression research studies, all found that elevated cytokines, especially interleukin-6 and CRP, were associated with depression. And I've listed some more recent references at the end of this talk. Meta-analyses of anxiety and OCD are a bit mixed, but generally, again, show increases in flow pro-inflammatory cytokines, although some cytokines are reduced. This may be quite surprising, but bipolar illness is also associated with neuroinflammation. And let's not leave out schizophrenia. Microglial activation is also seen in the development of schizophrenia. Here's a recent excellent study showing that infl inflammation precedes the onset of a serious neuropsychiatric disorder, in this case, schizophrenia. The PET scans of healthy, high-risk and schizophrenia patients showed an increasing gradient of microglial activation in their brains. The cause of inflammation found was not studied. I, of course, would love to know about the presence of water damage in their homes and schools. Alzheimer's, the ultimate neurodegenerative disease, is associated with increased cytokines, including transforming growth factor in the cerebral spinal fluid. I've had several diagnosed Alzheimer's patients over the years told after we treated the underlying inflammation and infectious illnesses that they no longer qualified for the Alzheimer's clinic. I have often wondered about the physicians discharging these patients. Were they even curious how an irreversible neurodegenerative disease suddenly reversed? Evidently not, since none asked what the patients were doing to reverse an irreversible diagnosis. Inflammation is also associated with suicide, and I've mentioned that passive suicidal ideation, meaning hoping death might occur but having no plan or intent to do anything, can be common in SERS patients. A number of patients have told me over the years they know they're getting mold exposure by the sudden onset out of the blue of suicidal thoughts. It's very strange in a traditional psych paradigm, 
but understandable when you realize that suicide is linked to inflammation and inflammation is related to mast cells in the brain, which we will discuss next. Low VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, is associated with both severe depression and completed suicide. I show this study because so many patients with SIRS and chronic fatigue also have low VEGFs. However, plasma levels, which we commonly measured, did not correlate with CSF levels in the study. Mast cells are the body's first responders to injury. Notice the time frames of cytokine release for mast cells. Release of histamine, tryptase, and tumor necrosis factor are almost instantaneous. Leukotrions and prostaglandins are within minutes, and mast cells can then actively actually manufacture and selectively release a number of well-known cytokines such as MSH, TGF-beta, and interleukin-6. I just reviewed the studies linking these same cytokines to anxiety, depression, and bipolar, even Alzheimer's and suicide. Therefore, I'd argue that understanding how to recognize and treat mast cell illness needs to be an important part of any integrative psychiatrist toolbox. The next two slides highlight multiple case studies compiled by Afrin linking neuropsychiatric syndromes to mast cells. These include fibromyalgia, migraines, neuropathic pain, chronic regional pain syndrome, autism, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and even neurofibromatosis. They have all been associated with mast cell illness. Other neuropsychiatric syndromes Afrin has identified include labile affect, now known as limbic dysregulation, motivation disorder, depression, ADHD, bipolar, anxiety disorders, panic attacks, and psychosis, including visual hallucinations, PTSD, disturbances of memory, word finding, and difficulties in concentrating. In other words, almost every neuropsychiatric syndrome known has been associated with mast cells. So certainly, this is an important root cause of depressive and anxiety symptoms. I will outline basic treatment strategies in my next video. In general, I have found recognizing and treating MCAS very helpful in treating the large number of neuropsychiatric symptoms I see every day. And a key point to understand about mast cell activation syndrome is that stress is a very potent, if not most potent, trigger of mast cells. Improving resilience to stress involves recognizing and working with trauma. Discussing stress leads us into our last root cause for today, trauma. Trauma occurs when our ability to cope with stress is overwhelmed. Our traumatic stress response involves the autonomic nervous system alternating activation of the sympathetic nervous system with the parasympathetic in a very predictable pattern. This is another diagram showing the traumatic stress response as activation, which most of us call anxiety right here, accelerates, we activate the fight or flight sympathetic system as activation continues to increase, our nervous system goes into overwhelm, can't take it, and the emergency brake is pulled. We call this freeze. Remember, health lies in learning to use our accelerator and brakes effectively as needed through connection with others and a sense of safety. This state is best described as alert, engaged, grounded, creative, curious, compassionate, a state I think that most of us would like to spend most of our time in. This diagram shows how psychiatric and physical diagnoses are related to the stress response. Sympathetic arousal can manifest as fight or flight. Fight is anger or aggression. Associated diagnoses are bully, narcissist, or sociopath. People on the warpath. Flight um, is anxiety, sometimes seen as the busy bee, always doing, never resting. Panic and mood disorder, ADHD, are also associated with flight. In treating mold illness, I see this behavior frequently as patients run from house to house in full panic. 
unfortunately, in that state of sympathetic overdrive or panic, they're likely to make another poor decision and end up with another mold home. And often people become so used to living in a state of high activation, also known as trauma brain, that they can find life without stress and chaos somewhat boring. Commonly, that lack of activity is misinterpreted as depression. It's not. The patient just needs re-education on how, fe how it feels to be relaxed, which is quite a statement about our society that people need to be educated in what it feels like to feel relaxed, happy, safe, and secure. Freeze is when the emergency brake is pulled on and the cell danger response emerges. So that's associated with depression, chronic fatigue, and dissociation are some possible diagnoses. And there's also functional freeze, where some people do what they're supposed to do. They're compliant, but seem to have shut down their capacity for joy. And it's pretty common in the working population. The fawn response is found in complex trauma. It involves both fight and flight at the same time with freeze and people may have a difficult time expressing their own needs and always seem to be putting others needs above their own. I frequently see this in a caretaking situations with what's called the, called the sandwich generation in between the children and grandparents. There is a very well-documented, well-researched, replicated predictor for the severity of many chronic illnesses, both physical and mental. It's called ACEs, or Childhood Adverse Experiences. It's a simple scoring system consisting of 10 questions that explore household dysfunction, parental separation and death, incidents of domestic violence, substance abuse, mental illness and criminal behavior, as well as physical or emotional abuse and neglect during childhood. I've included a link where you can take this questionnaire to see where you stand. A score of four or more correlates with increased risk of depression, substance abuse, cardiovascular events, diabetes, and most recently, even Alzheimer's. So what happens during your early years can affect you in your very latest ACEs can affect the development of the brain as a child, as well as hormones, the immune system, and even genetics or how our DNA is expressed. About 16% of the U.S. population has a score of four or above, and that number is substantially higher in clinical settings. Clearly, trauma is playing a much bigger role in physical illness than many of us in clinical practice understand. And in my experience, everyone, both clinician and patients, would much rather ignore the role trauma has played in their life development and rather would focus, focus on micromanaging the cytokines and supplements. Yet some of the most outstanding successes I've seen in my patient population in the last few years have been when a patient starts working with their trauma history, in particular when they remove the unstable, unpredictable adult continually causing trauma and chaos from their home. Or as one of my patients told me recently, I've removed the people from my life whose drama was keeping me from getting the sleep I need. And she, by the way, has made incredible improvements in mold and lime, despite having very little monetary resources. Um going to end now and there is the third part here where I'm going to be talking about more effective treatments for SSRIs than um, SSRIs or psychotiles for depression, anxiety, and sleep. <laughs>